interested in is uh, how much of a genes fold change is uh, due to the due to external factors rather than due to the network effect and uh, i will describe what i mean by the network effect um, assume that you have some kind of a undefined network inside a cell we know that expressions of one gene affect the expressions of other genes and uh, so they form a network within the cell and uh, uh, if you have an external factor that affects the expression of one of the genes say you have uh, um, srna targeting that uh, gene or you have snps affecting that gene any of these that affects the expression of the uh, of the gene the the fold change that you see in that gene ripples down to other genes uh, who which might not which might be known or not known uh, to its targets and then the effect ripples down until multiple genes have uh, a fold change uh, between two states and uh, when you do a microarray analysis between cancer versus normal for example um, you see thousands of genes that are differentially expressed and quite possibly there are a few uh, or a, some uh, direct uh, directly affected genes and many other genes are uh, just responding to the environment or responding to their upstream genes or responding to transcription factors um, so those those I, uh, genes i call uh, they are affected by the network effect and the main gene that is affected by the external factor my my, uh, my problem is to find pick that one gene out out uh, uh, and separate it from all the other ones where you have the network effect affecting the gene and uh, I call the network network effect the the predicted fold change of a gene given the fold changes in its neighboring genes. And again, many of these terms are undefined right now, but I will define them in the next slide. Um, so the, the the idea is that if I have a gene G1 and I know which genes affect its expression, um, and I want to find out if there is an external factor affecting the expression of G1, what I can do is I can create a model of gene expression. Uh, for G1 using the expressions of G2 to G5. And then I find the difference between the predicted expression and the actual expression. So any difference, if there is a big difference between the two, there is an external factor affecting the expression of this gene. If the predicted value matches the actual value, then there is no hidden hand there that is pushing the gene expression up or down. It is all due to the effect of the genes around it. And so this is not something you can do with uh, usual association arrays where you look at uh, create a network using correlation or partial correlation or mutual information because if I uh, have some kind of association between G1 and its neighboring genes, it still does not tell me how to predict the expression of G1 given the fold changes in uh, G2, G3, G4, G5. Uh, so what? So we cannot predict the we don't have a model to predict the fold change of G1 given the neighboring genes uh, fold changes. So I, uh, what we need is a quantitative uh, predictive model. So uh, what I propose is something that uh, Emily and uh, Mario had shown before. Um, basically, we use, uh, use a linear regression or uh, in, the, in the first ca uh, initial case, it would be a linear regression. It can go on to uh, future things, but um, use a model that predicts the expression of a particular gene given the expression of other genes. And the other genes I call the source genes, and this, uh, the gene whose expression I'm predicting, I'm calling the target gene. And this does not imply any kind of causality between, uh, between uh, these two genes. So for, for example, the, the source genes and the target genes will form a network. So you have um, uh, source genes connecting to the target genes, but the only thing that these genes, uh, the only relationship of these genes to that gene is that their expression predicts the expression of this one. It does not mean that it is downstream in any particular pathway or they are um, transcription factors or anything like that. Because we have uh, cross-sectional data and it is not possible to find out actual causality using that, uh, using that kind of data. But it is still a useful model. And uh, so, so how do we select these source genes? And there are various ways of doing it. People use uh, lasso, um, uh, 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 Emily had mentioned BBSR, so there are various ways of doing it. I chose a very simple way, a recursive way of uh, finding the first gene that correlates best with my target gene, and then I look for the second gene that correlates best with the residuals from the fit using just one gene, and the third gene which is which correlates well to the residual from these two genes. And every now and then I will uh, 
do a, um, I will leave uh, the gene, the worst gene from this group out and add in the best gene from the outside uh, to improve the fit. And I stop when the R square or the worst gene that, that gets added uh, goes below 0 0.0625. So again, these are all ad hoc uh, um, uh, thresholds that I used. And this actually puts a th threshold on the number of genes that goes into the model. So you cannot have more than 12 genes or so that actually are used in each of these uh, models. And uh, now here I hit the first roadblock. And the roadblock is that you cannot use normal samples. So the idea is that I use normal samples from um, all kinds of data sets, create a model, and then I try to predict the expression of my perturbed sample, which could be disease sample, SIRNA, drug treatment, all of those. Um, so I'm basically trying to find out how much of the normal, how much of the behavior of the genes is captured in the by the normal network and how much is not captured, how much is unexplained. And uh, the problem is that I cannot use data from just one organ. If, if I'm saying I'm interested in pancreatic cancer versus normal, I cannot just use pancreatic normal samples, create a network and try to fit uh, pancreatic cancer samples because uh, the genes that I'm most interested in, the ones where I have the biggest fold change between cancer and normal, those are the ones where um, a, a, a model built on, the, on this set of expression is not going to predict the expression of these uh, samples very well because they are outside of the range of the it, of the uh, of the model. It's uh, I'm trying to extrapolate outside of the range of the model. So what I need, uh, and it could be much worse than what you are seeing here. You could have uh, genes that are not at all expressed in, in pancreatic normal, but highly expressed in pancreatic cancer. So you need you need to include other organs to borrow information from the other organs. So if it, my gene is not expressed in pancreatic normal, I need to find samples where it is expressed and then use that to uh, find the behavior of the gene. Uh, of that gene in the normal situation. Um, so now here is the second problem that I am building a model for a gene. Will one model suffice for all organs? Is Does one model of gene expression regression uh, suffice for all organs that I have? And it is not very clear because most people make independent networks. So if, if I'm doing brain studies, I do make a network specifically with brain samples. It is not clear that uh, a, a network made on another set of organs will work well on, on another set of organs. So uh, this is what I did. I uh, took uh, 4,700 samples of uh, annotated, normal, healthy, untreated samples from uh, GEO. All of these were on U130 plus 2 arrays, uh, sourced from 70 different organs. So you can see the, the number of samples from each organ. Blood is overrepresented because it is so easy to get blood from uh, people. But other, so that could cause a bias in terms of what the uh, final model uh, fits. Uh, but there is a wide variety of uh, samples, and uh, uh, it represents a large number of different types of uh, uh, normal samples. I batch corrected it using a novel scheme, which um, which is not that necessary because with 4,000 samples, batch effects are uh, are another source of variation rather than a systematic bias. Um, but uh, it, I, I did batch correct a little bit to, to remove obvious uh, differences. And now I want to cross-validate this. And the most fair way to cross-validate it would be to leave out any, uh, leave out an organ uh, as a test uh, sample and leave out all other organs that are correlated to that organ because I don't even want organs that are similar to the organ uh, in the training set because that's going to give me um, an optimistic measure of my performance. I want to leave out. I want to leave out one organ and all its correlated organs. Completely different organs form the training set. Create a class uh, predictor. Create a network on the training set and try to predict the expressions on the uh, on the test set on the left out. So I clustered the mean um, average uh, expression of each organ and clustered them and divided the training and testing samples into according to the clustering. So the for these samples, for example, which are all brain-related samples, they are going to one test set, and they are all tested on um, a training set that contains no brain samples. Um, at the end of it, I do have a grab bag of uh, samples that are 
I have few sample uh, numbers from each of them. Uh, they I don't know the actual uh, organ it comes from. Uh, so I, I put everything into this other category, and these are all these these yellow ones. And uh, the other sample, other category gets left out of every training set because it has a wide range of organs, and I don't want it uh, making the um, classification, the pre the prediction look better than it actually is. And once I do the cross validation, I go through the entire, I leave out the test set. On the training set, I create this entire network, select the genes and the sources and everything de novo. Um, this is the cross validated R square. And for 10,500 genes, I get a R square greater than 0.25. So it's it's actually not not bad. And the uh, there is a number of genes. The uh, about half of the genes I get a bad uh, R square less than 0.25. But of that, many of those genes actually have a very low range um, of expression. So I'll get to that uh, point later. Uh, let me just show you a few examples of what different R squares look like. Um, so point three, uh, really there is some correlation there, but there is also a lot of noise, all the way up to top two A, which has a very high correlation um, and high R square. Um, and note that this is uh, this is the 45 degree line. So it's not I'm not talking about correlation of the predicted versus the actual. I'm talking about actually quality of the predicted versus uh, actual. And uh, if I break down the number of genes with less than, uh, with R square greater than 0.25, according to the test samples, so how much am I able to predict liver gene expression given all other organs? Um, you see the number of uh, genes for, for liver itself is not that high. So it's about maybe 15% 15, 15 of the genes are Predicted, predicted with R square greater than 0.25 if I li on liver if I use do not use liver at all. Uh, but the, there is one reason for for having a low R square, and that is if you have a very low variability of the uh, expression itself in the test set. And if I have a very low variability, then uh, even if I'm predicting it correctly, the there is no no variation there to explain. So R square is really bad. So if if I include those genes were I have low variability in that organ, but the prediction is good. The number of genes for which R square is greater than 0.25 or the variability is very low, but the mean difference is small, that jumps up. So I get a between 60 to 70% of the genes are um, predicted uh, in each of these uh, organ groups. And uh, this is something that is surprising to me because uh, it means that there is a lot of the lot of the normal network that is shared across the different organs. Each of them, uh, the effect of a, of the expression of a particular gene, the correlation of that with other genes does not change all that much if you go from organ to organ. So there is, uh, it indicates that there might be some kind of a reference network for for biology, which could uh, for for normal behavior, which could be compared to all kinds of different disease uh, uh, networks. Um, so now, given the network, what I can do is I can predict the expression of a given sample using the expressions of its source genes. Um, uh, I can predict the expression of the, tar of the target gene, and here you see an example for CCAM7. Uh, the the brown points are the normal uh, samples, and they follow the equality line very well, which is not surprising because the model is based on those samples, on uh, the normal samples. But the colon, the colon cancer samples also actually fit very well. So even though there is a fold change between the between the normal and the colon uh, cancer samples, that fold change is completely or mostly uh, predicted by the fold changes in its nearby genes. So this is one gene for which I would hypothesize that there is no hidden factor affecting the fold change. So this is one gene that I can safely leave out for the next time and concentrate on the ones where I do not have this kind of uh, correlation. Uh, I tested this uh, this uh, network out on siRNA perturbation uh, data and uh, uh, siRNA uh, perturbation is the, is the easiest uh, to test because I know exactly where the external factor is, what gene it is affecting. Um, is the same idea that I, I have fold changes for neighboring genes. I use it to predict the expression of fold change of uh, a given gene and compare it to the actual fold change from the sRNA uh, data. I had uh, 387 sRNA knockdown samples with associated controls with uh, where the sRNA target fold difference is less than minus 0.5. So it, it, uh, there is actual knockdown of the target. Um, I, uh, 
various different types of siRNA target genes, uh, mostly related to cancer, various cell lines, cell types and cell lines. And uh, the correlation between the predicted and the actual fold difference is reasonably good. So it's between 0 0.16 to 0 0.55. And you can see the predicted fold difference versus the actual fold difference. And in all of these cases, you will see one, so each, each point is a gene and um, the, uh, the gene that is actually knocked down in the SIRNA is, is up here on the, as in the title. And each of these, you will see one gene that, that is down there whose predicted fold difference is almost equal to zero, but the actual fold difference is very high. And that's the SIRNA target. So these are, SIRNA target is the one place where my network does not predict the fold change because there's an external factor affecting it. And that is exactly what I'm trying to find out. Um, so you see a wide range, uh, goes up to 0.55 with uh, CDH1. Uh, there's a difference in the, uh, depending upon the type of uh, gene I'm trying to predict. In summary, I have a model that predicts the expression of a gene given its network neighbors. A single model per gene fits expression across multiple organs. Effects of perturbations can be quantitatively predicted. Um, genes whose expression do not match the predictions are the ones that are putatively affected by external uh, factors. Uh, this model can be extended to incorporate SNPs, methylation, copy number, any of these things uh, change gene expression. And, um, right now, they would all be predicted as external factors, but if you include them in the model, they become modeled also. Um, model predicts siRNA fold change, and you cannot estimate causality from this, and even though the siRNA results seem to imply that I can, I'm predicting causality, but no, it does not predict causality. And there is a web tool, if anybody is interested, you can go there, put in your genes of interest and find the source genes for that. You can click on the gene to find, uh, add its source gene, add target genes to it, and click on any of these uh, on this magnifying glass to s look at the predicted versus true expression for a wide range of uh, sample groups. Thank you. Good question. In the network uh, results that you showed with about 60 to 70 percent good predictions, yeah, yes. uh, where do the tissue-specific genes fall? Not tissue-enriched, but tissue-specific ones that ideally shouldn't be expressed anywhere else. The, yeah, the, the are they in the 30 percent that you don't have good R squares? Exactly. Or? Yeah, they, they would be in the, in up here. So there are there are genes for which I, I see this were if I leave out say liver. I do not get a good prediction on the liver uh, liver test set. If I leave out kidney, I do not get a good prediction on the kidney test set. But if I include both liver and kidney, all other organs are well predicted. So that tells me that there is some kind of mechanism going on, where different mechanisms going on in the liver and the kidney, both of which have to be in the model to predict the expression of the gene. But once I include both of them, so th there are there are these there are genes that are spe who, with specific mechanisms or specific co-regulations with other genes um, that are specific to the tissue. Um, and those would all fall in this in this empty space up there. I also wonder if you can use this as a way to um, predict how much blood contamination is, was in any given tissue sample. That, that's that's actually interesting because I can uh, look at I can look at what what exactly which genes are coming up as in the different lymphocytes and. The problem is that blood is one of the biggest component in my um, in my models, and I, I do not know the f absolute fractions of the different components of blood in the samples that go into it. If I have data like that, then it would be an interesting study if I can deconvolve the different fractions of blood, definitely. Um, so this could equally well be a question for the previous two speakers. So um, I mean, in these linear models, what you're doing is you're taking a linear approximation of a nonlinear gene regulative process, yeah, sure. right? And that assumes that there's a steady state and uh, you know, a linear approximation would be valid for small perturbations around that steady yeah. state. Yeah. So one thing is, you know, is it known that you are at a steady state? That's one thing. And second is, you know, in terms of fold changes, you know, what, what kind of a fold change is this uh, approximation valid for? The um, since you talk about fold change, I will say that fold changes are only valid. You can only speak about fold changes if everything is linear, because otherwise you have to talk about a fold change and you start about where you are talking, which range you are talking about. So implicitly, everybody, all of us, we have a linear model in our mind, and 
most of the correlation things, uh, networks that we make, most of them assume a linear model between genes. And uh, um, uh, that being said, the linear model will not fit for most, probably not fit for many genes, and it is probably not valid. And something like uh, the maximal correlation method that I uh, listened to yesterday, something like that might be a useful. Uh, method, a yeah, 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 of course, yeah, 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 yeah. Something like that would be uh, a good uh, uh, so plug-in. But uh, the linear model offers a lot of benefits that you just cannot let go. So you have to you have to try the linear model model at first to see if you can even get at least fifty percent of the genes fitting the linear model. Everything else you can go into more complicated. And the way I have the system is set up is you each gene is predicted by a single model, and uh, you can refine each of these models as much as you want with nonlinearity, time series, all kinds of things without affecting the other genes. So it's a, it's an incrementally improvable model. And um, uh, no matter which part you improve, and that, that is my hope that eventually I will include more different types of data set. I will include time series data to find out if I can get causality of some kind. But the fact that I have refined a particular set does, of genes means that does not mean that the other genes are no use anymore. I can still use the models for the other genes. But yeah, you're right. There is probably going to be other kinds of factors that come in. So linearity is probably not the last, but it is the first option. Let's thank the speaker.